come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. Once upon a time, and not so long ago, the family was the backbone, the continuity of life. Mainly the continuity. And with woman only recently elevated from Mrs. to Ms., the family began with a sire and ended with a scion. Unfair, unreasonable, ridiculous, of course. Right out of the Middle Ages. But the habit persisted through the Victorians. This tale falls midway between... A story of a man's fall to the consuming fires of eternal hell. And it begins appropriately enough with a roaring, crackling fire. Our mystery drama, The Dice of Doom, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Ian Martin and stars Michael Wager. It is sponsored in part by Anheuser-Busch Incorporated, Brewers of Budweiser, and Buick Motor Division. I'll be back shortly with Act One. The fascination of the future. It haunts and tempts all of us. If we could just know what it held for us. But that's only because if it should be bleak or full of disaster, the human heart cannot help but believe that foreknowledge would help us somehow to change it. But in saner moments, all of us should realize it is far, far better not to know what fate holds in store for us. How much better Rudy Schroll would have been had he left it to luck, fortune, the roll of the dice. That is, any dice except the ones he came to own. Father, I'm... I'm still alive, Rudy. Take me upstairs. Of course, but I, I, I want to know what was in the papers you burned. Have no fear. I shall not let life go until I tell what must be told. But upstairs, please. I want to die in my own bed. I picked him up in my arms. So frail and wasted, he seemed lighter than a child. Carrying him up the stairs, my mind was racing backwards through all our life together. Fondly, happily. Sadly, now that he was to die. But as strong as any feeling possessing me at the moment was curiosity. Curiosity aroused because coming home unexpectedly a few nights before... I had found my father hurriedly stuffing a sheaf of yellow manuscripts into a safe I never knew existed. Behind the portrait of the reputed black sheep of the family, my great-great-great-grandfather, Helga Schroll. As I laid my father on his great bed beneath the pleated tester, he answered my question. The manuscripts you saw me putting away the other night, the ones I burned this evening, were written... By your ancestor, Helgar. They were a history of this. Oh, Father, let me go for the doctor. No, 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 son. I'm beyond any mortal help now. I was going to say the history of our predestination. And it has all turned out just as Helga wrote in those pages so long ago. And... What can have been so terrible? We've been an exceptionally rich and lucky family. Long-lived, even... Even you, Father, outlived my mother and all my long, sad list of older sisters. I have no time to dwell on others. My own time is too short. And yours? You mean... You mean... My time is also short? Other than that, I cannot tell you. Only... That you... Are the last of the shoals. The family ends with me? Yes, but in return, you are promised two things which will bring you every worldly advantage you desire. What? They... They were not named. I only wanted to protect you. Protect me from what? The one to whom you're... Great, 
great, great grandfather sold all of us to. Oh, who else but the. No, no! I, I will not go, Father! I didn't ask to! Father! God receive you to heaven as you deserve. So I came into my inheritance. An inheritance which didn't last long. The last of the shrove of the natural good spirits of youth soon forgot all feelings of gloom and doom. I returned to the university in a life of wine, women, and most important of all, the siren song that was the theme of my life. Now, by my hope of heaven, send me an eight. Anyway. There goes your hope of heaven. Ha, ha, ha. Still, your aunt, he was close enough by all odds. For once, seven is not your lucky number, Rudy. <laughs> For once? When is it with these accursed dice, Friedel? My dice. May we continue? How? You've taken every fennec I own. Not except I owe you, old friend. Well, my guardian has refused to honor them. A harmonious old tightwad. I'm on his side. Since you were to marry my sister, I don't want you a pauper. Oh, Charlotte, you need have no fear of that. The way you throw your money about, my friend, she shouldn't count on it. Now, if she were to choose me... Well, she didn't. Poor girl. She doesn't know what she's missing. Oh, well, lucky at dice, unlucky in love. So, the game is over, I take it. I have little taste for any further... If you need money, Rudy, borrow from me or take back what you lost. You know we're friends, and what's mine is yours or your heart. Oh, thanks, Friedel. But my guardian will be here by tomorrow and make all the wedding arrangements here, Eva. Is the date so soon? My father is close enough to members of King Frederick's court to hear rumors of war being imminent. Oh, wouldn't that be great? War? We should all be officers, we three. We'd be commissioned immediately. Released from the bondage of this grinding charnel house of education. Doesn't it make your blood boil with excitement? I'm not so sure a man can get killed in a war. Oh, not an officer, Rudy. They're much too valuable to waste. Well, see you on the rampart, fellow soldiers. <laughs> He's such a good-hearted fellow, you can't help liking him. Well, I do in all ways except one. I'm, I'm always afraid I'll lose Lottie to him. You're jesting. My sister loves only you. I hope. I don't like his love for the battlefield. Oh, he loves war no more than you or I. He's a romanticist. It's the trappings, the, the uniforms that attract Friedel. At all events, I'm glad of the rumors myself. You? Yes. Because it will speed up your marriage to Lotta. I think she's just what you need to settle you down before you... before you give in completely to your other love affair. What love affair? Gambling. The dice. If I had my way, I'd see you and Charlotte married tomorrow. As it happened, Johann was a better prophet than he could ever have realized. Lotte and I weren't married the next day, but with foreign affairs worsening, we were married within the next month. The following weeks were the happiest of my life. Lotte brought me a handsome dowry, and at last I had control of my own estate. And then... War broke out. There was no escape for anyone who considered himself a gentleman. Johann Friedel and myself prepared with, I must admit, great excitement to leave for the front. Rudy, I think you must be mad. Oh, I have to go, Lord. Everyone has joined the colors. Johann Friedel. My brother and that conceited Frederick von Holtzborn are not married. They are not leaving a wife behind. Do you want to be ashamed of me? I want you to be alive. I'd like to have a father for my child. You're having a child? Mine? Well, I... I hope you don't think it's anyone else. Oh, oh, I didn't mean that. I mean, oh, it's it's so wonderful, dear. I, I, except except I, what? I, well, I, 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 I can't explain. Just some family mumble jumble. It doesn't mean anything now. Oh my darling, you can't know how happy I am to know that there's to be another generation of shrews. Well, why shouldn't there be? And since you're going to be a father, you should be excused from fighting. Lottie, you're right. 
I'm going... I'm going to resign my commission today. Unfortunately, I quickly discover that to leave an army is an infinitely more difficult thing than to join one. Although I would not admit it, I was as disconsolate as my wife. I had no desire for warfare when I reported for duty with Johan and Friedel. Still, the first months in camp were enjoyable enough. There were balls and festive dinners and a great deal of parading and being offered the favors of young and beautiful women who were completely captivated by soldiers. And there were the never-ending dash games. At which, unfortunately, I lost and lost. Never ending. That is, until one day. Well, boys, this is it. This is what? The war, the front line. Our chance to prove ourselves at last. Prove ourselves now. Why, that cannon fire is cutting us to ribbons. We've got to storm the hill and spike those guns. So, order the men to attack. They must be led, not by me. What are you, a coward? No more than I am. We wouldn't have a chance, Friedel. We'd be cut to ribbons before we got halfway there. Not with my luck. Follow me, and you'll be safe. And heroes, dead heroes. Rudy is right. You'll take your chances. I'm going to give the command to charge. I'm your superior officer, and neither of you can stop me. Here goes. Soldiers of Persia, I command you. Oh, oh. Oh, Rudy, what? You shot him! Madman, you would have let us all of that cannon fire. We'd all been killed. But your friend, how could you kill him? I value my life more than his. If you value yours, draw your pistol carefully. Aim away from me and fire it. Why? If you don't, I'll kill you too. Uh, as you will. Here comes the cannon. Remember... Your pistol has been fired too, so I swear you that it's three shots that we don't. Luck will get away with it. But our luck held only up to a point. Nobody had seen which of us fired the shot, but the bullet was lodged in the back of the head. Johan and I were separated and held for court martial. It is the decision of this court martial that murder has been done. And one of you must pay the penalty with your life before a firing squad. I ask once more in the name of God and of your honor as a soldier that the guilty one confess and not have two murders on his conscience. I did not do it. Rudy, how can you... Would you make your sister a widow to save your own life? I did not fire the shot. Very well. The Scots Marshal hereby pronounces the death sentence. The fate of the man that I will be settled by a roll of the dice. Low man will lose. God, take him away. All that night I wrestled with my conscience. What little I had left. By morning I was almost ready to confess. Even the family prophecy was against me. With my child in Lotte's womb, I could not be the last of the shrove. So what hope had I for the promise of the two things that were to bring me every worldly advantage I could desire? I will leave you alone with Lieutenant Shrove, Father. Perhaps you will have more luck in inducing him to confess than you had with Lieutenant Brandt. Well, my son, do you wish to confess? Father, I... <coughs> You're no priest. You're Friedel. The man I killed. True enough, as the friar pushed back his cowl, his face seemed to be that of the murdered man. Was this some trick of Rudy's tortured conscience? Had Friedel somehow not died... Was this a genuine priest? Or if he was not, who else could he be? And what control had he over Rudy's future? I'll return shortly with Act Two. In the cell, tortured and dizzy after a sleepless night, 
facing the fact that a throw of the dice may place him before a firing squad within hours, Rudolf Schroll gazes in horror at the man who stands over his bunk, clad as a priest, but whose face is the face of the friend he murdered. Or is it? For to his fevered gaze, the face seems to swirl and shift and take on many forms, till Rudy is sure of nothing. So, little brother Rudy, I suppose you never expected to see me again. Who are you? You don't remember me? Is it so easy to forget an old friend's face because you shot him in the back? If you mean Fredo, Friedrich Hals Pony. He was mad if we'd followed him, we'd all have been killed. No doubt. You were quite right to shoot me. You? I... I don't know who you are. Your friend, Friedel. Friedel is dead. Oh, well, what's in the name? Do you wish to confess his murder? No. Uh, well, no. Then have no fear. I will not expose you. But, Friedel, if you are alive, somehow The man I... you knew. But I am afraid. Within the next couple of hours, roll the dice may condemn me to execution for his death. Why not? You're guilty. Oh, no, you can't trick me that easily. Dear Rudy, I can do with you whatsoever I desire. You're not Friedel. I am he whom I choose to be. For this moment, your friend. Remember the story of the manuscript your father burned... Two things will bring you every worldly advantage you desire. They will come to you in time. In time? When? How? Who are you? I wear the frock of a priest. Can you not trust them? You are no man of God. Then you must guess who I am. Still, trust in me. I dared not admit to myself who my strange visitor was. I was numb by fear. And before I knew it, I was led for myself to the place of execution. A large and expectant crowd lined the route and followed me to where a sand hill had been built for the execution. It was there I met Johan. Rudy, you still will not confess. What about your sister, Lotta? Lotta, bring your drum. Well, then, drum. Yours is the first roll. Here are the dice. Throw them on the drum head. May God defend me. Double sixes. God heard my prayer. Well, do you wish to roll, Lieutenant? If I match it, what then? We roll again. Give me the dice. One of the dice. It broke in two. Yes, there's no reading the number. <laughs> Has anyone else a pair of dice? Uh, if you please, Your Honor, a poor peddler, but I have dice for sale. The army does not have to buy. I commandeer one pair of dice from you. Give them to this man. Now, so. Yes. My turn off. Double. Six. Yes, uh, uh, then we must throw again. You first, Lieutenant Grant. I, I cannot ask God to defend me again. He has not treated you kindly, a two and a one. So? Yes. So, fixes again. So be it. Take Brant and bind his eyes. Make ready for the execution. Should I, Pedro? No, my friend. Yours. The two things that can bring you every earthly advantage you desire, as they have already. You're no peddler. You're... What? Friedel, the priest? Or... Shh, mention no names. I'm your benefactor, so long as my pact with you exists. Listen. Ready? Aim! But for me and those dice, that might have been you. 
keep them. They will roll for you what you wish, win or lose, until your time is up. On the sand hill, my best friend and my wife's brother lay dead, riddled with bullets. My only other friend I had killed. Or had I? Was it some shade from beyond the grave who had placed the magic dice in my hand? A magic they proved to be. I could move or win at will, and in no time I had bought my way up out of the army. My life, even my wife's, became the lure of the gambling table. Connor? Oh, it's you, Lizzie. Who else would you expect, Lottie? Oh, this stupid little maid of mine. I'm waiting for her to bring my dress. What's the matter with any of the others? Nothing I have will fit me. This child of yours is ruining my figure. On my word, I'm glad in more ways than one you're carrying a child. What does that mean? Even as it is, the men all pay too much attention to you, and sometimes I think you to them. The baby, the baby. That's all you care about anymore. Not me, just your precious child. I don't know how important it is to me to have a son. A son, a son. My body is just a machine to manufacture your son and heir. So help me God, if for no other reason than just to spite you, I pray night and day for a daughter. Oh, <laughs> if I produced a lowly female child, wouldn't there be the devil to pay? What? Are you all right? Why do you ask? You suddenly went as white as a sheet and, and stood there as though you were listening to someone else or, or, or something inside you. It was nothing. But I, I didn't mean to tease you about our child. If you're angry about that, I'm... I'm not angry. I'm... Oh, that'll be Elsa with my dress. Now, are you going to take me gaming tonight? Tonight? All right, but afterwards... I'll, I'll, I'll meet you downstairs in the library. I had to be alone for a moment. Things had been happening so fast and so fortunately, I set my mind against thinking about consequences. But now with two quick brandies to clear my head, I began for the first time to face a riddle I wondered if I knew how to solve. As the last of the long line of shrews, fame, money, and love are my share. Except how the devil to keep them if my wife bears my son and my heir. Where did you come from? Who are you? Who else but your friendly fool? Your jolly court jester, your majesty. Ah, uh, perhaps you'd recognize me better in this shape. Fiddle, again... Would you rather look upon me as I really am? No. No. I, I, I must be going mad. You, you can't be Friedel. Of course I can't be Friedel any more than a peddler, a priest, or a jester. You know who I am. You also know a pact was made with me long ago, that you would be the last of the shrouds. And that I would give you two things that would bring you every worldly advantage you desire. I have kept my part of the bargain. The devil's dice you have. But you have not kept yours. Your wife is carrying a son. There's nothing I can do about that. There is no way I... I can destroy my own unborn child. But I can. You have only to ask. No. Very well. You have made your choice. One last word. If you ever need me, light a fire at the last stroke of midnight, throw in the dice, laugh loudly. The dice will split, and I shall come to you. <laughs> What are you trying to do? Set, set the house on fire? The smoke is as thick as a blanket. What need have we of a fire if we're going out? And such a fire. It smells as if the devil flew down the chimney. 
Not down, little wife, I wanted to say. But up. But I had no words left to say in a raging desire to bury my thoughts. Make my mind a blank. Shut out everything with the wonderful fever that brought me every night to the tables. Where I could win or lose at will. For I, I alone was king. Astro's point is ten. Dice. A five and a two. Seven is a loser. That is 40 to the first better, 20 to my hair number two, 50 to the lady. What's wrong, Rudy? You lost again. That's right. But this is the tenth night running. Now you must go back and win. With what? With your luck, your magic touch. You always end up winners. Mm, this time, apparently, I can't go back. Why not? Because I have no money. No, but my jewels. Already pawned. We're bankrupt, Lottie. But what are we going to do? Come along. We must. We must get home. I have, I have things to do. I put a sleeping powder in Lottie's evening draft that night. Then I built a fire, striking the first match at the last stroke of twelve. Then at the fire court, I threw in the dice and laughed. A wild, hysterical laugh with a life of its own that shook me from scalp to the soles of my feet. A laugh that became a sob. At the last moment, I tried to reach for the dice and, and draw them back before it was too late. Gambling is a fever as overpowering and as vitiating as drugs or alcohol. All can be cured with the addict's cooperation. But eventually there comes a point of no return. The point Rudy has reached now. Will he pass it? Or is it still not too late? I'll return shortly with Act Three. stands before the fire he has just lit, his hand extending to pick up the dice from the flames. But in the very act of reaching, he draws back. Is it fear or greed that forces him to leave the dice there to split in the heat and summon up his nemesis? Is he committed to take another step on the road to eternal hell? It's too late. The dice have cracked. <laughs> Am I not the one you called? Yes, but you are, were, are always in some other form. This time the occasion is serious enough for you to see me as I am. Why did they call me? The dice. They've lost their power. Through whose fault? Uh, nearly 200 years ago, I made a pact with your great-great-great-grandfather, Helgar Schroll. For close to two centuries, I have lived up to my side of the bargain, as your ancestors have lived up to theirs. Only you have tried to change the terms. I just want what any father wants, a son. A son to carry on the family name. Yes. No. My pact was for five generations, and I want no more of the shrows to trouble me. No child. But how can... Leave that to me. But I don't want my wife to be hurt. Would you rather I took you now as I can do with your contract already broken? No. No. No, I... No. <laughs> Have no fear. Your wife will come to no harm. You will live out your time on earth. And the child would never have been born in any case. You underestimate my power. And your dice will have their magic again. See that in all else you obey me, or they will be disarmed, and I shall drag you to the pit that moment. 
Satan be with you. He was gone as suddenly and completely as he appeared. A devil from blackest hell. And yet as he spoke, his face had rippled like a reflection in a windy pond. And the form kept changing. Changing, ever changing from satyr to Friedel to the priest to the peddler to the croupier and back to the satyr again. Malevolent, diabolical, menacing. For a moment it seemed a dream and... Then I was looking at the dice in my hand. Whole again. And hearing the final proof. Rudy! Rudy! Help me! I... I'm losing the baby! It took a little while to raise enough to get started again. But once I had a stake, I was merciless. When I cleaned out everyone's pocket in one town, I'd move on to the next. We lived up to every magnificent penny I made. Our parties were legendary, haunted by every profligate in Europe, stained by every sin in the lexicon. Lotta failed to recover her figure. Wine and brandy the culprits now. The Baron von Schrollhausen, as I called myself, was much too rich to be unattractive. No matter what my excesses. And so at last we came to the Riviera in France to run up against my most formidable rival in the game of chance. Who is that perfectly gorgeous man at the baccarat table? That, my pet, is the Comte de Mauvray, the second most important gamester in Europe. Mm, some say the first. What the matter? We'll settle someday. Uh, is that the uh, Comtesse by his side? It is. <laughs> and she is beautiful. She's a painted hussy, that's all. Oh, He's getting up. Perhaps he'll come our way. Glotta, here's a hundred thousand francs. The wheel is waiting for you. Oh, but I... I I prefer to meet the Count alone. Go. Yes, Rudy. If you insist. Very few things would tempt me away from the Baccarat table... But I believe I recognize the great Baron von Schollhausen at your service. And I'm flattered at the recognition that Comte de Mauvais is, of course, known worldwide. Oh, I'm flattered in return. May I present my Comtesse Margot, the Baron? A pleasure long deferred, Monsieur le Baron. But that is your wife who just left? <laughs> oh, yes, Lotte, she is. Not at her best these days. Oh? Well, I'm being unfair only because I am blinded by your beauty. Oh, oh, fluttering little hand lay in mine like a bird's as I kissed the back of it. But from her palm to mine was passed a tiny ball of paper. Well, Baron, it was fated we should meet eventually. Eh? Why do we cross swords? <laughs> at what game? Chemin de Fer is my favorite. Unfortunately, I do not play cards. Ah, only the dice. Then, uh, since I am challenger, choice of weapons. When do we begin? Since you select my game, the time should be named by you. Uh, tonight, I'm committed to Chemin de Fer. Tomorrow, I must leave for business in Marseille. <laughs> uh, shall we say one week from tonight... Accepted. In the meanwhile, bonne chance at our tables. But save your best for me, eh? Now, if you'll excuse me, I must return to my game. Um, you, monsieur, must take me and introduce me to uh, your baroness. May I suggest a glass of champagne? Oh, what a delightful idea. Especially since they are serving on the other side of the casino. <laughs> Especially. <laughs> it will give you a chance to glance at the billet doux I passed you, unobserved by either of our spouses. I must admit it has been burning a hole in my hand. So I shall read it as we stroll. Unobserved. <laughs> Except by you. But it's nothing to be afraid of, since I wrote it. You. The pavilion. My own petit trianon. A 
private little retreat of mine at the other end of our chateau garden. <laughs> and your husband will be away all next week. May I expect you? No. Must be a woman in France. Why me? Regardez vous même, Baron. I'm no beauty, Madame la Comtesse. Ah, you are something far better and more exciting. A man among men, a gambler who wins and wins. A man like you can see my very blood. But your husband. My is... husband and I are one thing. You and I, another. Besides, you will be away. I shall expect you tomorrow at, uh, say, four. You are marvelous. Everything I expected of you. My lover, my strong one. What is your strength? My strength? Is your desire for me? Then meet me again. Tomorrow. Here. Same time. The same magic hour. What makes a man a gambler, Rudy? <laughs> I don't know what makes a man a doctor. Study, dedication, desire. Uh, well, for a gambler, the first two. But the third, that's... That's a fever, Margot. Must we waste our short hours together talking? Not when you mention fever. That's what you've become for me. But you've already won me. Not enough, not yet. Not for me, with you. Oh, what I really meant yesterday, I suppose, was what makes a man a winner? What makes your husband one? Ah, that's simple. He's rich enough to be able to play long enough till the odds have to tilt his way. What happens to us when he comes home? Do you go back to him? I am a very selfish woman, Rudy. I love my pleasures and my comforts and you. Then if I promise you I will win the game, do I also win you? Oh, you'll never beat Le Comte. <laughs> Three days later, the great game began. I let the 200,000 francs ride. Will the Comte cover me? The Baron is covered. Very well. Eight is the point. He's the eight. Anyway. Seven. I win. My dice, I believe. Eleven. A winner. I let all ride. How much is in the pot? 840,000 francs. You're covered. A natural lucky seven. Will you call me again? It was impossible. Five nights in a row I lost to the cup. With my dice, but that couldn't be. No one could cast a spell over them but me. Unless. I drew them from my pocket, examined them, twisted them this way and that under the light. But that was part of their secret. How could they be told from an ordinary pair? And this was no ordinary pair because I never let them out of my visit. Margot, let go out. I'd been taken in by one of the oldest tricks in the world. Where are they, Margot? Rudy, where are we? My dice! You stole them from me to give your husband. Rudy, don't be silly and... and... I suggest the same thing. So you're here, Monsieur Le Comte. Very well, my dice. Or I swear I'll shoot that witch and charm them away from me. I don't have your dice. I warn you. I'll shoot her if you don't give them up. Shoot and be damned. Ah, Dieu. No. Mon Dieu. <laughs> You've killed her. Just as I'll kill you to get my dice back. They are not yours, Rudy. They are mine. And I decided it was time to take them back. Poor Margot. Still, her death will serve a purpose. You will be guillotined, my friend. But don't worry. When you join me, I'll rejoin you. 
damn you, my dice! You can't damn me. You think not? That was enough to kill me when I was Friedel, old friend. But you need more firepower than that to stop the devil. There was some disagreement among the judges at the trial as to whether Rudolf Scholl should be guillotined or sent to a madhouse. But the Comte's face, as he testified, was so white and frozen with grief that Rudy's wild story was judged a deliberate attempt to escape his crime of conscience. He died under the knife, fulfilling the prophecy that he would be the last of the souls. I'll be back shortly. As for the dice themselves, no one knows what happened to them. There have been stories since of winning pairs that make fortunes for their owners. It's doubtful with so many professional mechanics in the field these days, the devil would bother with dice. He has so many more fruitful opportunities as the world turns today. Our cast included Michael Wager, Carol Titel, Ian Martin, Gordon Gould, and Robert Dryden. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by Sinoff, the sinus medicines. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. Tonight's WR Mystery Theater was brought to you in part by ShopRite Supermarkets, where you get a lot more for a little less, and by Suburban Savings, with offices throughout New Jersey. The preceding program was furnished by the Columbia Broadcasting System.